All right, and we'll be speaking on industry and academia, a perfect geocoding match for curriculum development. My name is Alexandra Wasco, as the gentleman said. I, I'm going to be representing the industry side of the presentation today. First, I'd like to start off with sort of introductions and then delve more into the cur curriculum development side of things. A little about me, which the gentleman also spoke already about. <laughs> I graduated from the California University of Pennsylvania in December 2012 with a Bachelor of Arts in Geography and a concentration in GIS and Emergency Management. A part of the uh, program's requirements is to get an, an internship before graduation. And I was fortunate to obtain an oil and gas internship in the summer of 2011. I've actually been employed professionally uh, since right after the internship, even before I graduated from college. Uh, I, I gained employment at Western Land Services in May of 2013 as a GIS specialist. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Western and how they fit in the industry as a whole. Western Land Services was formed in 1974 and over the past 40 years has leased an excess of 7 million acres, provided services in 36 states, assisted, assisted in the drilling of nearly 11,000 wells, and secured over 80,000 miles of right of way. Uh, some of my roles at Western Land Services include, again, kind of repeating here, uh, I assist with leasehold creation and maintenance, uh, wells and permit databases creation and maintenance. I manage multiple GIS projects throughout the United States with main concentrations in Appalachia and in Texas. My project work varies from leasing, due diligence, and title to right of way all the way to web GIS using Flex. The GIS department at uh, WLS is one of the vital departments. It's currently 56 strong and is responsible for one third of the company profit in the 2013 fiscal year. Company-wide, there are over 600 employees, meaning a mere 9% of employees were responsible for one-third of the profit. This one statistic alone gives you an idea of how important a role GIS can play within a company in the industry. Other ways GIS maintains an important role in the company and in the industry is through data creation. Examples of this include leasehold mapping, uh, both present and legacy, uh, areas of interest mapping, proposed well sites mapping, right of way mapping, including um, proposed routes. Uh, another way that GIS maintains an important role in the industry is through quality check and control. Uh, things like verifying that a property is not within an active unit, uh, checking for lease overlap, acreage discrepancies, <coughs> status mapping, things of that nature. Another way that we maintain an important role is through support data. We maintain parcel well and permit layers and also provide pipeline, street, and raster data sets. And uh, also another way, last but not least, is through improving safety when drilling. We can have detailed drawings of well pad sites available in almost real time. Now about the oil and gas industry in general, there are well over two dozen major shale and basins in the United States alone. This map right here displays the major basins across the United States. And the, uh, the employment rate in the oil and gas industry by itself has blown away all private sector employment since 2007. The support sector, which the employment in includes supporting activities for operations, <coughs> including exploration, excavation, well surveying, casing work, and well construction. The support sector has grown 55% since 2007. The extraction sector, which involves, uh, which the employment's primarily engaged in operating, developing, and producing, has grown 37% since 2007. The extraction sector, or sorry, the drilling sector has grown 8% and the drilling sector involves, uh, it's directly related to spotting and drilling of wells. Um, meanwhile, the private sector has only grown 1% since 2007. So as you can tell, there's a very real demand for oil and gas employees and GIS specialists play a very important role. But who supplies these GIS specialists? Academia does. So now I'm going to go a little bit more into the GIS curriculum. I'm going to talk about my experience at Cal U a little bit. The GIS portion of coursework for the oil and gas, or sorry, for the GIS and emergency management concentration at Cal U is mainly revolved around six courses, which are GIS 1, crime mapping and spatial analysis, demographic analysis, emergency management, remote sensing of the environment, and a GIS 2 course, which is usually a special topic course, um, and the rotation while I was at Cal U was environmental GIS. Each course was very valuable and laid the groundwork for GIS students to specialize later after graduation. 
In my opinion, courses were based on particular topics because the topics were generally useful, but also easy to apply lessons on GIS concepts, skills, and tool sets. Items like basic cartography skills, Tom's seven map essentials, joins, raster versus vector data, feature creation and editing, coordinate systems, data set research, and accountability. Well, how does oil and gas fit in all of this, fit in the curriculum? Well, oil, oil and gas is one niche of the GIS field capable of teaching all of the general lessons and then some, while preparing students for one of the largest GIS specialist job markets out there. I don't believe oil and gas was overlooked at my alma mater intentionally, but the wide range of lessons merely unrecognized. I became involved in course development with Tom after I started to put together a leasehold mapping tutorial for new GIS specialist at WLS. Tom was already in talks with WLS about possible internships and about gathering oil and gas information for a new course at CalU. The leasehold tutorial seemed to fit the bill for Tom's needs. The tutorial covers the what, why, and how of leasehold mapping, and now here are some examples of the training, the training material provided to Tom. This slide is one of the first slides that are in the tutorial. Uh, it just covers the basics. Uh, it's the difference between a surface and a mineral tract. It, it, it uh, goes into detail about wh which is which. There's also examples on the, on the right side of the, of, the, of the slide here. Um, also, I just want to say before I show any more of these uh, slides, there are, in the PowerPoint presentation, there are extensive notes with each slide. So if Tom were to give the presentation in, in class, there are extensive notes, much more detail, um, anything that might pop up in conversation after or during the presentation is kind of covered in the notes. This next slide here is one of our slides covering one of the first steps of leasehold mapping. And it just covers the, the documents that we pull from the courthouse, the different types of, of documents that we pull. Also in the tutorial are slides that show each type of document as well. And this slide is one of our step two slides where we start to talk about how you map, uh, how you pull that parcel data from the document, where it's at in the document, what it looks like, um, what a parcel is. And, uh, and we, we highlight, you know, you can see in this example here that we highlight where the parcel number is. And we have more steps, step two continued, there's more slides on this as well. In this particular slide, we actually show examples of the GIS and uh, the parcel data set and how to copy and paste into the data set. Part of our step three slide is, is our uh, checks and balances here. We're checking for acreage discrepancies, we're checking to make sure there's no other leases on the property, um, make sure there's no active wells on here, and we, we go over all of these quality check and control items in the tutorial. One of our step four slides is entering the, specifics, the, the specific data from the documents into our attribute table. And step five, which is kind of the last step, um, there are more slides on this as well, is symbolizing the layer according to the client's needs. This particular example, this slide, is uh, symbolizing according to Lessie. And one of the last slides in the presentation is uh, covering important leasehold terms. And again, in the notes, there are definitions for all of these terms here. Some other material that was provided to Tom, there were more leasehold symbology examples, like I said, uh, like open versus leased, what that looks like, HPV, HPP versus non-HPP, um, and expiration symbology as well. There are, we also included well symbology in the tutorial, what that looks like, um, a little bit more about each, each symbol and what it means. And toward the end of the presentation as well, we discuss project-based work, try to tie it into the bigger picture, um, leasehold, how leasehold mapping fits into the bigger picture, what else we do. Uh, we go in a little bit into operations and right-of-way mapping and uh, deed plotting for mineral reservations and, and things like that. And uh, now Tom is going to talk about how he took this information and created a course. Thank you very much. Again, I'm Tom Mueller uh, from Cal U. As you can probably tell, I always say this, I was born in South Jersey, so I never need a microphone. <laughs> First slide. So I come back from this meeting and, okay, now I have all this great information. So how the heck am I going to get it in a 15-week course? So one of the things, in fact, Alex immediately said is, I don't think you have enough for a 15-week course. I said, that, well, let's not worry about that. Let's see where we are at. So I have a little matrix system, and I started to fill in, you know, okay, this lecture with this lab and a discussion of what we need here and how this is going to be built 
and is there a logical order, different things like that. So, you know, what you see in the black is sort of the general information she gave. And this isn't a week-by-week -week basis, so don't think, you know, because a couple of these are two, three-week uh, long uh, topics. And then I said, well, you know what, you know, if we're going to do georeferencing, let's go a little more into digitize. Let's go a little more into, you know, the dealings with digitizing and how that impacts a geodatabase in different situations to that. And if we're going to talk about georeferencing, let's talk about linear referencing. Department of Transportation, hydrogeographers use linear referencing. It's important that maybe the students are not going to get their masters in linear referencing, but are going to be able to have an intelligent conversation with somebody about it. And finally, this issue of conversion of data. You're going with all these different documents and you're going to put them in a spatial database. Well, all that different spatial data, all those different documents, you have to understand. Wouldn't this be a great way, for example, uh, I got Mike and I got Vance telling me, Tom, you want your students to be really, really employable? No, they shouldn't only know ArcGIS, they should also know FME. Understanding those conversions, and that will teach them then the concepts. Perfect. Called FME, called up safe, we can get some educational copies, we get this working. So here we've got the course, and okay, now we've got this 15-week course, so now I feel happy. Next slide, please. So now it's to build the labs. And okay, here's the kicker. I have students, I guarantee, that go, parcel? The heck is a parcel? I don't know what a parcel is. So I'm going to have to introduce that to them and those concepts and how that applies into a GIS. And then especially, uh, I'll talk more about this later, the editing of parcels in a GIS. ArcGIS has a very specific process of doing that. And then how that applies in ArcGIS versus FME versus even something like QGIS. So you can understand the differences, the nuances of that data. And then adding all that leasehold data in. Here's the other thing that sometimes we forget, and, and I'm going to talk about this when we talk about FME software, is we sort of say, OK, students, here you go, boom, into the deep end, hope you can swim, <laughs> right? And you pray to God they can. But the kicker is, we have to build them up. You have to understand all those concepts that Alex brought together, because if not, they're adding attributes. Yep, I can add, I know how to type. You know, great. I, they learned that in seventh grade. But if they don't understand the information they're putting in the database, what good is it going to do? It's not going to do them any good. So then we're trying to talk about digitizing and GPS land data. We got the trimbles, get that Pathfinder, all those wonderful issues that sometimes we have with Pathfinder. And then bring in those issues of conversion of the data formats with FME. Again, you can't just, and when I teach students ArcGIS, I don't say, okay, you know what? Remember the classic, those of us who all remember our GIS class, remember the watershed? We all had deal with your freaking watershed, right? So the only <laughs> thing anybody ever wrote about in those workbooks. But here's your watershed, drop them in and start processing. No, we just say, look, this is what a pixel is. This is what a point line or polygon is. We need to build them up on that. And with that, then we have to do the same with that software. What is a CAD drawing? You know, not just the stuff we talk about in our, our regular, our basic courses, 311, not in our just basic 311 course, but the intricacies of all of that data, the, the problems with some of that data, and really get into that. So all of those are part. Next slide. So I build this whole thing, next, and I feel like Rocky Balboa after Rocky II just knocking down Apollo Creed. I did it! It's built! This is great! We did it! Problem. Now I gotta go through academia. If you were from Pittsburgh, that would be a picture of Franco Harris. Maybe. At the airport, right next to George Washington. Which I never understood. But anyway. So, but now I've got to go in and now, as for example, some of the people out there know, now I gotta take it through my world. And my world, unfortunately sometimes, doesn't know how to deal with the real world. So okay, so now I have to deal with student objectives. Okay, so that was one punch from Clubber Lang, right up to the chin. And not only those student objectives have to be measurable, they have to be in some sort of order. And that measurement then has to be a report. And after that report is given, if the report isn't uh, authorized by outcomes assessment, then Harrisburg isn't happy. And then I got Tommy Corbett at my front door throwing me a right hook. So now we got real problems. So I had to go through all of these hoops. And that's some of the issues that we deal with. In academia, we're thrilled. We want to we want to really work with real issues. We want this stuff. But sometimes in our world, going through the hoops. I mean, everyone laughs. Oh, I can't believe you got a dissertation. Dissertation wasn't that difficult. It was. I did the research, finished it, and then they were like, Oh, you have to write it. Why do I have to write it? I finished it. Can I? That's it, right? Move on. Give me my degree. No, you got to jump through hoops. And that's the way it is in academia. So I had to go through those. Next slide. 
So I had to put it in academic lingo. I had to, which believe me, is always interesting. I had to think about those discussions because then the issue becomes, well, how, how do you want to make sure those discussions? Because we've all been there, right? In fact, we may have it now. We may say, we're done, there's questions in here. You know, crickets. You know, how do you engage the audience? How do you get them to understand and bring that stuff out? Jump through these hoops. Really have people understand it. And that's what I had to do. I had to go through all these steps. Okay, I got what industry says we really need and we're missing. Because that's what Alex said. Alex said, and Westernland Service, you got some great GIs people. I didn't pay them to say that, believe me. I still have that tapered forever. I'd get that tattooed on my neck if I needed to. But you have some great GIs people, but they're missing this level. They're missing this information. That okay, we've got to fix that hole. And that's what we were trying to do. And now I had to get academia to understand that. Next slide. So then I sent the rough draft after it was put in academia speech back to Western Land Services. Is this all right? Understand it's, it looks a little different than when you last saw it, but is this really what you guys are looking for? Is this really what you need? Is this really, will this allow Joe Cool or Joanne Cool will go in and they will be able to get the job? Because again, this is what I tell my students, this is all I want. I want you, I want you to have that $7 million job. You want to know why? That means you're going to pay more social security taxes. That means I can retire. And really, that's what this is all about. Okay? So they said yes. And they said, this is what we're also going to do. The training materials that Alex has brought about. You can use those in your classes. I said, great. Here are real materials that the people are learning from in the industry and understanding those documents. We have guest lecturers. I said, look, I want you guys to come in. Because, and I want you guys to talk to my students. In fact, I just actually was talking to a couple of people who are actually going to come in. And then you know what I do? Then I leave the room. And I allow the students just to talk to those people. Because sometimes when the professor's there, it's like, well, I have a question, but I'm not sure I'm going to ask it correct, so I'm, I'm not going to ask it. Forget it. Right. But if I leave the room, all of a sudden the students start asking questions. It starts to become that dialogue back and forth. They start networking. That's really what we really want them to do. And finally, to have those possible projects. In fact, one of the things Alice and I talked about was, what kind of questions do you think we'll get? I said, well, maybe somebody will ask, how will I know if, if I'm testing them correctly? She goes, we have a test. She goes, in fact, I, they talk. We'll share the test with you. Wouldn't that be great? To give my students, before they take the course, the exam that Western Land Services gives their students, gives their new employees, take that part of the course, then give them the test again, see where we're at. Not only, I mean, and for those students who've had me or you've had professors before, not because we want to see what you screwed up on. What did we screw up on as faculty? What didn't I teach well enough? What needs to be ramped up? What wasn't clear? Okay, because those are the particulars. And those are the things we have to think about. So then we come to the conclusion. And in conclusion, industry and academia should always strive to work together. If industry can inform academia of its needs, then industry can only benefit with better trained, more experienced entry-level employees, and the potential for internships. The same goes for academia working with industry. Academia can attract a greater range of students, obtain a higher employment rate, and more connected alumni. And, and what this picture really shows, and, and you know, you love the canned pictures, but this is what it's about, okay? It's about academia and industry coming together. And, and I'll be perfectly honest with you. Somewhere along the line, academia, we fell apart. I'll throw us under the bus. We did. We came up in our own little ivory tower, you have heard me talk about this, and we said, hey, as long as we're creating new knowledge, we don't care what's going on down here. The problem is the students that we're teaching, they gotta worry about what's going on down there. And that's what's important. And so, you know what thrills me more than anything being at this conference? I got Andrew Shears here one of the GIS extraordinaire professors at Mansfield University. We had St. Francis here, okay, another academia institution. We have members of the Community College of Beaver County in this conference listening to all these presentations because they would like to start a GIS program. That's what it's about. It's about going across the table and talking. Hey, we may not be able to figure it out. This, we may have come up and I've been like, there's no place to put this. But maybe there is, even if I couldn't create a new course. Maybe there's something when we talk about attribute data that we talk about leasehold data. And we bring that information together and we build on it. Because that's really what it's about, folks. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a Coca-Cola commercial here for Kumbaya, all right? 
But really, academia, for the most part, has fallen off the cliff on this. This is where the jobs are. This is where my students are going to get jobs. They have to be prepared. If John is saying, look, I'd love to hire your students, but this, 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 that doesn't help my students if I don't react to that. Okay? Now, I may not be able to be like, John, I can't do this, but you know what? Maybe I call somebody up, you and I talk about the computer sciences program. Hey, look, you've got this Python course. You have this JavaScript course that I really want my students to take, and they're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to take your course. Uh, well, you know, unfortunately, they need seven courses before they take the JavaScript course. Damn. Okay, what do we do? You've got to start to think out of the box. So maybe what I do, and one of the things we talk about is, you know what we'll do? We'll have workshops. Forget the college credit mumbo jumbo malarkey. Let's talk about programming, and let's talk about it at the GIS level. Let's. I have access to ESRI's Python courses. Let's sit down. Let's open an online communication. I'll take the courses, you take the courses. Let's see where it takes us. <coughs> maybe that's the avenue. Or maybe it's, hey, you know what? We can't do it, but community college <coughs> the county does. Or maybe it's some other avenue. But to say, well, there's nothing we can do, so that's the end of the story, that doesn't, that doesn't jive. Again, I'm sorry, I grew up in the 70s. That doesn't jive, <laughs> OK? We have to do something, and we, as academia, have to do better. And so what I'm asking for you, I'm standing up here, and I'm asking for you is help us be better. Help us prepare your employee, future employees better. And if you have to, believe me, did I want to go to Alex's company and hear about the holes in the curriculum? No. Nobody likes to hear that. But that's life. And if I don't react to it some way, somehow, then it's just going to hurt my future employees. My, your future employees and my current students, and I can't have that on me. Okay? Remember, let's work together, because that's really what it's all about. Thank you.